had Mr. Presley's predecessor town manager ever asked WEMSA to prepare or work on with the town a local EMS plan? No. And at some point in time, though, you were requested by Mr. Presley to work on a local EMS plan for the town. Isn't that right? Yes. And when was the first time that Mr. Presley asked you to do that? That was at the January 30th meeting, 2024. All right. And is Exhibit uh, GG the local EMS plan that WEMSA prepared in accordance with the request by Mr. Presley on behalf of the town? It is. All right. <clears throat> by the way, um, back in August of 2023, when Mr. Presley asked what is the status of the plan, was that at or around the same time that you were in discussions with Aetna to try to work out an arrangement for the ongoing coverage of BLS and ALS in the town of Wethersfield? It was. And and it was during that period of time that Mr. Presley was also engaged in the discussions. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And at that point in time, you understood Mr. Presley to be acting in the role of facilitator. Is that right? That's right. So we're, the proposal that you considered from uh, Aetna Ambulance and uh, that, that's been reviewed during your testimony today and on Exhibit 14, um, was that the proposal that continued to be the topic of discussion that you worked on in, in the uh, meetings and, and calls yes. and communications between Aetna and WEMSA? Yes. And that, did that include the um, request for the $500,000 subsidy as the option that was focused on in the discussions that ensued? It did, yeah. And you had concerns about that option as you've testified to, is that right? Yes. What Can, can you elaborate on what your concerns were other I than the cost? Yeah, there was an objection. I apparently was. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Yeah, no. Uh, we're we're just back to your testifying counsel, and 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 Mr. Uh, Mr. McMahon is, you know, giving assent to you what you're testifying to. So I'll withdraw think... the question and ask a uh, different way. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank yeah, you. counsel. Just remember, you're not on on cross this time, so. Just ask the question and he'll answer it. Yeah, it's not my usual. Uh, Mr. McMahon, what were your concerns um, with regard to the proposal that became the focus of the discussions with Aetna in terms of <coughs> um, one that included WEMSA expanding its hours and level of service. Can I, can I ask a clarification of what proposal you're referring to given the sure. history? Okay, uh, let's, let me ask it a different way. Would you agree that the proposal, uh, well, let, there were three proposals. Could we have um, uh, exhibit, town exhibit 14 brought up please? And I'm sorry, I my exhibits are in one document and I can't easily pull it up on my screen without having to scroll, scroll through 250 pages to get to it. <laughs> so I'm sorry to ask you, I can pull up my own exhibits today though. Thank you. Just for assurance, while we're pulling that up, I did spend an hour and a half with my IT person <laughs> to to try to clear up the issues that were presenting yesterday, and hopefully we'll have some luck as we go forward. 
<clears throat> but I may lose my voice in the process. Can, can you not see it because it's it's up on the screen now? I can't see it, so let me go out and come back in. Just... Chief McMahon? Yes. Um, I'm showing you what's been marked exhibit, town exhibit 14. <clears throat> and you re recognize this exhibit, don't you? I do. All right. After you received this exhibit, you and Aetna engaged in negotiations about these various options. Is that right? That's right, yes. And going forward, was there any particular option that became kind of the preferred option? <clears throat> of these preferred yes. none were preferred right i believe you said uh, mr presley had identified option three as being the um a non-starter <clears throat> That's right, yes. Now, of these options, option three indicates WEMSA going 24 7 with EOS and 24 7 with paramedic intercept, correct? Correct. <laughs> Did you have any concerns with this particular option? The one for 500,000? Yes. Well, the biggest concern I have is that it was a very lot of money. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I'm, I'm always concerned about with respect to, especially option number one was, was it, and again, I'm just a trial lawyer. I don't know this stuff, but it never, I didn't know if it was legal or, or not for them to offer, <coughs> Um, a zero bid, a time limited zero bid to get us out of town uh, in exchange for referring all the EMS calls uh, to them uh, 100 percent with no competition, with no uh, only one company in town. I always was concerned about, especially with Medicare and Medicaid involved, is that anything involving uh, antitrust or anti kickback? I'm not an expert in that field, but that always that always bothered me. Okay. So, and and I take it option one was flat out rejected by WEMSA. It was yes. Okay. And and you would agree that the hearings today actually are about WEMSA being eliminated from the town as a provider, and Aetna, in accordance with its submissions. Uh, for a zero bid contract for five years, <clears throat> covering all the responsibilities in the town to the exclusion of other providers. Right, making us close our doors. Yep. Um, I'm just. Gonna, I'd like to just lodge an objection. I've allowed this to go for a while, but this witness was questioned extensively by counsel on direct. Um, at this point, she should be limiting herself to the scope of cross. Which I, I don't have any further questions with regard to that document. Okay. Hold on one one moment, folks. I'm getting some background noise. <clears throat> okay, so I'll sustain the objection. Council, just remember to keep your redirect limited to cross, please. Yes. <clears throat> Um, there was some mention with regard to the NEFRS contract and comparing it to the uh, Aetna $500,000 ask for paramedic coverage and um, whether the NEFR option was more expensive than what Aetna was offered and why you would choose that option over Aetna. Do you recall that testimony? I do. Um, and why was it that you 
um, maintained a position that the NEFR option was preferable to WEMSA? Uh, it's uh, much more intensive. Uh, there's much more services for less cost. There's cross training. The paramedics uh, come into our building to train with the EMTs, uh, which makes the services better. Uh, there's a, a team spirit. You know, when they do come in, they do quality assurance. Uh, they do a lot more than Aetna uh, has ever um, offered. And we'd also be saving uh, $300 per intercept call too. Just lastly, going to the mutual aid contracts, you were asked about having written agreements with Aetna, AMR, Trinity, and Ambulance Service of Manchester, known as ASM. Uh, do you recall that testimony? I do. And um, had you personally reached out and tried to get those contracts in place in writing? Uh, yes, uh, John Quinlavin has reached out to them uh, over the phone and in writing many, many times. So was Mr. Quinlavin not you directly? Under my direction, yes. John was responsible, yes. And to date, I believe your testimony was that um, you don't have any written contracts from any of those commercial providers. No, we don't. But you do have mutual aid contracts with the towns that surround Weathersfield, including Newington, Glastonbury, Rocky Hill, and New Britain. Is that right? I do, yes. And of the um, mutual aid agreements that you have with those towns, do those mutual aid agreements cover BLS and ALS calls for mutual aid? Yes. Before the witness answered, Attorney Menchel, you have? Well, the objection is she's referring to the towns, but the evidence was that the mutual aid agreements are not with the towns, they're with specific ambulance companies. So I think the question misstates the, the facts. Okay. So if there was a different line of rephrase it. Uh, I don't mean to be misleading with my question, counsel. There are mutual aid agreements, and there were your questions were. Were there written mutual aid agreements with those companies? And his answers were no. But as indicated in the plan, and it's been submitted, there are written mutual aid agreements in the record that have been admitted as full exhibits. And those mutual aid agreements are with Newington, Glastonbury, Rocky Hill, and New Britain. They're not with the towns, they're with Newington Volunteer Ambulance Association or whatever its particular title is. And if you want to rephrase your question to say who those agreements are with, okay, then I'm fine with that. But Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Chief McMahon, does WEBSA have written mutual aid agreements with the Nonprofit providers, uh, for example, Newington Volunteer Ambulance Association. Yes. And does that cover mutual aid for ALS and BLS? Yes. Does um, WEMSA have a mutual aid agreement with Glastonbury Volunteer and the Ambulance Association? Yes. And do. does that cover the BLS and the ALS? Yes. She has a problem. Um, Sierra's at the place. She, they need to verify the number with you. May we just take a, a, a moment? There seems to be some type of emergency requiring the chief's attention. You're muted. You're muted. I'm sorry. Just five, yes, absolutely. So we'll we'll, we'll take a 10 minute break. We're off the record. Thank you.
Attorney Moore Lenhart, is everything all set on your end? Yes, we are. Okay. Thank so you. You're welcome. It hasn't been. The call 10 minutes, came but... in, and we, it, you know, for the chief, and we had to address it. Thank you. That, that's fine. I mean, mm -hmm. feel free to do that anytime. I mean, it, those things happen. Um, so if we can get everyone else back, we'll start again. But um, I don't see. We have the court reporter. Okay. Just, just waiting a moment for Kim Reinhardt. To... Okay. All right. Thank you, Attorney Mitchell. Okay, there she is. All right, let's go back on the record. Okay, Attorney Moore Lenhart, you may proceed. Thank you. I, I don't know where we left off which company, so I'll just backtrack a little bit. Um, I think I was at Glastonbury, Glastonbury Volunteer Ambulance Association, which may do businesses, Glastonbury EMS. Chief McMahon, do you have a written uh, mutual aid agreement with that organization. We do. And is that to cover BLS and ALS mutual aid calls? Yes. All right. And then uh, Rocky Hill Volunteer Ambulance Association, do you have a written mutual aid agreement with that organization to provide mutual aid at BLS and ALS levels? Yes. And I think I covered uh, Newington. With regard to New Britain EMS, does WEMSA have a written agreement with New Britain EMS to cover mutual aid calls for BLS and ALS services? We do. And do you expect that you will continue to have those agreements in place if the um, plan that you've presented to the hearing officer is approved and WEMSA remains as a provider in the town of Wethersfield? Absolutely. <clears throat> uh, one last area of inquiry was the bundle billing arrangement and um, uh, I believe your testimony was that a bundle billing arrangement with Aetna for Medicare calls of a certain category was put in place recently and the billing um, for calls goes back to August and you recently received those bills to process from Aetna, that's is right. that right? That's right, yep. And what is the status of the billing that's been received by WEMSA in connection with that bill, bundle billing agreement? We received the bill uh, late last week, I think it was on Friday, and now our quality assurance, we go through that to make sure that uh, everything was properly coded, that it wasn't um, improper use of, a ALS, so our compliance team is working through those numbers as we speak. So they haven't been submitted for payment to Medicare at this point in time, have they? No. Okay. At what point in time, uh, let me strike that, once the bill gets submitted to a payer for payment, does it then go on to your accounts receivable list? It does. And is that all done in coordination with your billing company? Yes. And who is the billing company? Um, uh, Accurate Claims, Kara, Kara Shields. And uh, Kara Shields, is she in, is Accurate Claims involved uh, with the audit, if you will, of the Aetna submissions for these bills under the bundle billing agreement? Uh, they are. And is there any other quality assurance mechanism that is utilized to review the appropriateness of the billings? Well, we have two. We have Kevin Clark, who is a paralegal. He's my assistant chief. He looks at them. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be having uh, Gerard Associates look at them as well. And I think I, I think I mis misspoke. Uh, those bills have been submitted in the due course. 
but now we're going through this is a brand new process, so we're going through this quality assurance process. Okay, and that's part of your compliant billing compliance activities. Yes. All right. Thank you. I don't have anything further of this witness. Okay. Thank you, Council. I do have some recross. I was I was going to ask if if anybody had any recross. So go ahead, Attorney Reinhart. Um, I'd like uh, Exhibit 35, please. And if we can scroll down. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you just keep the um, the entirety of that email. You see the header on it. Yeah. There you go. Um, so this is a July 1 email from Steve Hotchkiss, and, and you are included on that email. Is that right? WEMSA is included? Uh, I'm included on, not on that one. I'm included on the one on top. Okay, but so Weathers Field EMS, there's emails on the CC line. That's Weathers, that's WEMSA, correct? My assistant chief, yes. Okay, so fair to say that the state reached out to the town and you asking for the updated local EMS plan. And did you do anything to try to ensure that that was being prepared? Well, that is an argumentative. Oh, overruled. I'll, I'll let the question stand. Uh, that is fair to say, yes. Okay. Um, and then if we scroll up, when Mr. Presley asked you what the status of the town's plan was as of uh, August 4th, fair to say you did nothing at that time to try to ensure that a plan was submitted. Objection argumentative, it presumes that the WEMSA had responsibility to ensure that there was a plan in place. There's a lack of foundation. There is no testimony or legal uh, showing that it was WEMSA's responsibility. In fact, if you look at the law, it was the town's responsibility. So I, I think it's an inappropriate question. It's argumentative. And if council wants to pursue that line, she should lay a better foundation and ask the question in another way. If yeah, I, I, I agree. Agree. No, I, I, I'm sustaining that objection. There needs to be some foundation for the question because I agree that it, it's not clear based upon the question whether or not WEMSA or the town had the obligation to prepare and submit the plan. I'm not asking about a legal obligation. I'm asking if in light of this message, WEMSA did anything to try to ensure that there was a plan or to help create that plan with the town as the designated piece are at that time. And if I can be heard on that as well, the, the fact is that in his prior testimony in response to my questions, he understood that, that the PSAR as information that's necessary and it was his responsibility to provide that information to the town. So now we've heard contrary testimony. Uh, so. Well, you know, I think that's that's a stretch, Council, to say that that testimony uh, justifies WEMSA having to take on the responsibility of formulating a town EMS plan. I, I think it's totally incongruent, and one does not uh, necessarily mandate the other. And it's a misconstruction of what the law requires. And the law requires the town to have it. And I believe there's uh, documents within the, um, the emails that have been submitted whereby Mr. Glowski that preceded this, I think it was a June 30th email, if I'm not mistaken, where Mr. Glowski informs the town manager that it's the town's obligation to comply with the statute that was passed in uh, 2014, I believe, Polk Act that became in effect in October 1 of 2014, but it was the town's obligation. And there's no mention whatsoever that it was the local EMS providers obligation to formulate such a plan. 
And if okay, you so have, if wait, you wait, have wait, documentation. Hold on. Council, and, and, council if, if you have, let's just stop just, here. Council, oh, sure. council. So attorney Reinhardt has already represented. She wasn't asking about the legal obligation. So perhaps a better question here, attorney Reinhardt, or a more clear question, I shouldn't say better, is, you know, something to the extent, did WEMSA take any action in response to this email? Did WEMSA take any action at this time to help the town prepare an updated EMS plan? Yes, that would have been done by my assistant chief, Kevin Clark. And you're testifying now that you did take action in August of 2023 to start working on an alternative EMS plan? I'm not testifying to that at all. What I'm saying is that uh, if that was, a, you can see it's directed to the assistant chief first. I'm just a copier on it so that Kevin Clark would have responded to him. I don't know what that response was. Okay. Do you even? Oh, no, sorry. Fair, fair to say that up until you submitted an alternative EMS plan or an EMS plan in connection with this hearing, that you did not either prepare a draft plan or prepare information that would become part of the town's plan in advance of that. The only plan that we had was the one, you know, that we have submitted, but that was done without uh, any input from the town, any input from fire, any input from police. But the answer to your question is yes, that was our plan based upon public information, FOI stuff, and our own statistics. Right. That, that plan was never shown to the town before the end of 2023, was it? It was not, no. Um, You talked about mutual aid a little bit, and I just want to ask some clarifying questions. You indicated you have a mutual aid agreement with Newington Volunteer Ambulance Association. You yes. please testified that that entity only provides BLS services, correct? They have it, but they also contract for the ALS, yes. But Newington itself is BLS. And who do they contract with for ALS? Uh, in Newington, it's AMR. And you have no mutual aid agreement with AMR, correct? We do not. Okay. And Glastonbury volunteers, um, they are also only ABLS service, correct? That's right. And their ALS services are pro provided by Ambulance <laughs> of Manchester, correct? ASF, that's right. And you have no mutual aid agreement with ASF, correct? Uh, correct. And Rocky Hill Ambulance Association is only a BLS organization, correct? That's right. Their their ALS are Attorney Reinhardt, you cut out on us. Sorry. The Rocky Hill's ALS services are provided by Aetna, correct? They are, yes. And you have no mutual aid agreement with that? No, nope, we've asked multiple times, but Edna will not sign a mutual aid agreement. Okay, I have no other questions. Okay, Attorney Manchel. Yes, I, I just have, have one. Uh, I, I thought I heard in response to your, uh, the questions from Attorney Moore Lenhart that I heard that GG, Exhibit GG, was presented to the hearing officer or was prepared in response to Mr. Presley's January request to you as opposed to the request of the hearing officer to receive a plan. Is that your testimony? That was, uh, he requested us to Who's prepare the, it and uh, we did. Who's the he? The, the he is Mr. Uh, Presley. And obviously we had to have a plan for the hearing officer too. So were there two different plans or is GG responsive to both or what? This is the plan, yes. Okay. But this plan doesn't specify whether it's gonna be 
with Neffers or East Windsor or uh, EMR? Do I have that? Uh, it's, it does not specifically say that, no. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Attorney Moore Leinenhardt, do you have any follow up? Um, I may, if I may just have a moment. Um, sure. I'm just looking for a contract. Um, may I just take five minutes? I have a uh, document I'm trying to find. Yes, we're we're off the record for five minutes. Thank you. Sharing page thirty three and just going to take it. ASM has the paramedic PSA for Glastonbury.
All right, we're back. I'm going to share a document. How's that? Okay, I can see it. Let's just make sure. Yep, everybody's back, so we're back on the record, please. You may proceed. Thank you. Can everyone see uh, Exhibit GG? Yes. Great. I'm going to go to page, um, I believe it's 33, page stamp there. I think you need to go up if you're looking for 33, right? You're at 40. Yes, I understand. I thought I just wanted to go back to that page 41 because I thought I caught a different title on there. Sensitive little thing here. OK, um, so I'm going to take you to the um, mutual aid agreements that um, you recognize exhibit GG as the EMS plan that's been submitted. Yes. All right. And this is the current local EMS plan that is presented to the hearing officer for his consideration from WEMSA, correct? Yes, it is. And uh, in association with the plan, you did review it prior to its submission? I did. And were you aware that there were mutual aid agreements referred to in the plan and filed in connection with the plan? Yes. Almost there. All right, so attachment C to your plan, drawing your attention to page 34, which appears to be the Ambulance and EMS Mutual Aid Agreement between Weathersfield and New Britain, Emergency Medical Services. <clears throat> you recognize this agreement? I do. And um, this agreement was accepted and signed by you is that your signature? It is. And that was on 12 29 23? Yes. So as you were anticipating moving forward with the new vendor East Windsor. Correct. Once the extension contract expired at the end of 2023 with that note, right? That's right. Okay, now this mutual aid agreement provides for um upon request basic and paramedic level mutual aid ambulance and response services does it not it does and has uh is this agreement still in place as far as you know yes the next agreement is between weathersfield ems association and rocky hill uh is this the same one this is one that was signed on 12 5 23 between Rocky Hill Volunteer Ambulance Association and Weathersfield EMS, again covering basic and paramedic level mutual aid ambulance and response services, correct? Correct. <clears throat> the next one is Ambulance and EMS Mutual Aid Agreement between Weathersfield EMS Association and Glastonbury EMS. Uh, do you recall this agreement? Yes. Is that your signature? It is. And this agreement provides for, upon request, basic and paramedic level mutual aid ambulance and response services, does it not? That's correct. Do you know who the paramedic provider is in Glastonbury? Uh, ASM. Ambulance Service of Manchester. Right. The sister corporation to Aetna Ambulance. Yes. Okay. 
And here's an EMS mutual aid agreement with Newington EMS. Um, upon request, mutual aid ambulance and response services. Correct? Correct. And you signed this agreement. I did. What was your understanding with regard to the um, EMS, sorry, ambulance response and ambulance and response services, what that terminology meant under this mutual aid agreement? Uh, basic and paramedic service. And who's the paramedic level provider in Newington? AMR. Thank you. I don't have anything further. I do have okay. follow-up. Oh. You have some follow-up? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'd like to go to page 10 of GG, and we'll go ahead and share. Okay. Um, if you scroll up, just so we can see what the context is, scroll sorry, the other direction, so we can see the header of that section. Um, this is mutual aid call arrangements, and if we scroll down to the paramedic ambulance or intercept, uh, fair to say that the glass and Mary and Rocky Hill do not show up there, correct? They're not listed there, no. Um, and with respect to Newington, it says that agreements would have to be modified to allow AMR, uh, the paramedic through AMR that works with Newington to be used, correct? That's right. Okay, so Newington cannot on its own agree to obligate the AMR paramedic to provide these services, correct? Uh, Newington has no problem with it. AMR has no problem with it. Uh, but uh, yes, it would have to be modified. Yes. And it has not been modified, correct? As of this date, no. Okay. Uh, with respect to Glastonbury, ASM holds the PSAR for, for ALS services, correct? Correct. So the town of Gla the Glastonbury volunteers cannot obligate ASM to provide paramedic services to, through mutual aid to you, correct? Objection, it calls for a legal conclusion. And while I fully respect uh, my colleague here, Chief McMahon, who's a very seasoned criminal lawyer and lawyer, I don't believe that the question is properly put to him for a legal conclusion, particularly where he doesn't have the underlying written contract that exists between the town of Glastonbury and its provider. We've established that there is no agreement between ASM and WEMSA. And we've established that ASM is the PSAR holder, correct? I, I'm sorry, there's an objection pending council. And my I objection goes to I'm the withdrawing. appropriateness. Okay, you withdrew the question? Okay. The Lastonbury volunteers do not hold the PSAR for ALS services, correct? I don't believe so, no. ASM is the PSAR holder for ALS services, correct? Uh, ASM for ALS, yes. So Glastonbury volunteers do not provide paramedic services, correct? They're BLS, correct. Okay. Uh, Turning to Rocky Hill, you've already testified that Rocky Hill is also a BLS organization. They don't provide paramedic services. I'd like to, to bring up exhibit PP, page 10. This is the contract with Rocky Hill and Aetna Ambulance. Under section 15, this agreement provides that the services provided by, by Aetna may not be subcontracted or assigned without written approval from the town. The Have document you? speaks for itself. I object to counsel to the point that she's interpreting the contract as okay. inappropriate. Pointing him to the provision of the contract. Yes, yeah, she has an asked no a question. No problem with yes. that. You have not received approval from the town of Rocky Hill to use Aetna 
as would be required here for paramedic mutual aid. Aetna has never agreed to it, no. Okay. I have no further questions. Okay, Attorney Moore Lenhart, anything further? Yes, just one follow up. So, Chief McMahon, as I understand it, you did have a written contract with the Rocky Hill Volunteer Ambulance Association to provide in writing uh, mutual aid at a basic and paramedic level. Is that right? That's right. Did that organization, Rocky Hill Volunteer Ambulance Association, ever notify you that it would be unable to fulfill its commitments under that mutual aid agreement to provide coverage on a mutual aid basis at the ALS level, no matter who its provider was? Never. All right. So as far as you are concerned, that agreement is still in place. Is that right? Yes. Um, but nevertheless, you did reach out to Aetna to request mutual aid from Aetna, and they refused to agree to give you mutual aid. Is that right? Yes, multiple times. Did Aetna ever notify you that that applied to the Rocky Hill mutual aid agreement as well? No. Thank you. Nothing further. Attorney Reinhart, anything further? No. Attorney, Attorney Menchel, anything further? Nothing, Your Honor. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Attorney Moore Lenhart, you may present your next witness. All right. May I have 15 minutes before I do so? Yes, we're off the record for 15 minutes.
Okay. I'd um, like to call my first. Hold on, uh, hold on. Sorry. Let's, sure. We're not on the record yet. Let's go back on the record, please. Now you may proceed, Council. Thank you. Calling my next witness, Jen Quinlaven. Okay. And would you and, call the uh, police were in the witness? Would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God or upon penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. And please state. Sorry, please state your name and spell your name for the record. John Quinn Laven, J O H N Q U I N L A. V is in Victor, I N. May I proceed? Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Quinlavin. Good afternoon. Uh, um, uh, Your Honor, I have previously filed an amended expert disclosure, which I think you can all see on the screen. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so in this amended expert Sorry. disclosure, which Hold was on. filed in accordance with your order, I one have moment. disclosed one Mr. Moment. Quinn Laban as an expert, and I inquire of this time as to whether counsel are objecting to Mr. Quinn Laban uh, being qualified as an expert or they want me to go through the presentation to qualify him. Attorney Reinhardt, did you have something? Oh, I, I was just a little confused. The, the amendment only added information about Mr. Quinlavin. It didn't alter the prior disclosures that had been admitted before those experts testified, right? I didn't alter the prior ones, no. This oh. is an additional number three. If you compare them, the prior ones are all the same, and number three was added. Um, okay, well, as to me, I, I, I think for efficiency's sake, um, I'd rather have any questions that I may have go to wait. There's no need to go through the qualification process. Okay, Attorney Manchel, any objection? Uh, no, I, I agree with uh, Attorney Reinhardt that uh, any questions that I have will be on cross-examination. Okay, so Thank I'll, you. I'll recognize him as an expert. Thank you. you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Mr. Quinn Laven, um, if you would please just briefly give a summary of your background, experience, and training. Uh, sure. So, my Foray into EMS started back in 1973, uh, taking my first EMT course up in Saranac Lake, New York, uh, one of the first EMT courses um, in the area. This was during the introduction of EMS as a uh, profession into the uh, medical career fields. Um, I then became a volunteer uh, EMT or COMAC volunteer ambulance on Long Island and served as a volunteer um, there and then took an advanced EMT class became one of the first advanced EMTs in Suffolk County. Actually ran the first cardiac arrest case in Suffolk County under that new system. I then opted to expand my knowledge and I enrolled in the paramedic education program at the University of Kansas Medical Center where I completed my certificate in uh, paramedic studies, as well as my uh, undergraduate degree. I worked in Douglas County, Kansas for several years, serving a population with a geography of over 300 square miles, um, with two ambulances, with very long response times. So it was a system in which I was able to gain incredible experience they had a tight medical oversight system with quality review. And I would say that after living through the second tornado in two weeks, 
I had decided it was time to move back east um, where I settled in the city of Norwalk as a field medic. And then within a short amount of time, became the operations um, manager, if you will, for that service, and then became the uh, director of that hospital-based service. It was while I was at Norwalk Hospital that I had the opportunity to uh, grow and expand that service, not only in the services provided, but in the uh, financial aspect to move it from a money losing cost center in the hospital to a profitable cost center. And uh, I'm, sh I'm sure um, many of our colleagues on the call that are working within the hospital environment recognize the value of not uh, being responsible for a money losing department and the uh, virtues of actually being a, a profit center. Uh, so we were able to make those changes um, through uh, several different approaches. Um, efficiencies were improved. Uh, mutual aid went from 30% down to 0.05% um, by working with the staff, providing them with the tools necessary to do that. And working with uh, finance, we went through the uh, long form process to get the rates up to a, an appropriate level for reimbursement of the services that were being provided uh, to the community. Additionally, at the, uh, around the same time, we were providing what was called intercept service to the surrounding communities. And many on the call appreciate what an intercept is, but just to refresh individuals, intercept basically works with the true meaning of the word intercept and in that the BLS ambulance will be en route to the hospital and will be intercepted by a responding paramedic. We were doing that for many years, um, and I'll, I'll date myself. So one of our intercept points uh, between Norwalk and Westport was the, uh, were the toll booths. So for those of you who are called the tolls on I-95, that was our intercept point. But we did recognize that most cases in which we were responding to cardiac arrest patients, we were providing too much, too late. So the resuscitation rate was abysmal. Uh, the whole process of packaging the patient from the BLS crew, having them do what they were able to do, and at that time it was an innovative uh, um, EMT defib program in place. So they were actually able to de um, defibrillate with manual defibrillators. But um, once the medics would arrive, and too much time had really gone by, to provide the advanced life care that was necessary for a successful resuscitation. Pardon me, I'm getting a, a, a bit of a cold here and hanging in. Um, so in any case, um, recognizing the futility of that, we worked with the, uh, the local community and put together one of the uh, first, um, if not the first uh, uh, arrangement in which um, paramedics were contracted to um, be stationed within a, another community. So the town of Westport and Westport EMS contracted with Norwalk Hospital paramedics to station a paramedic in their station with their crews to work uh, as a team member and respond to calls um, uh, either on the ambulance or in a fly car, but it was a simultaneous dispatch. So within two weeks of that, the implementation of that program in December of, I believe it was 83, uh, we had um, our first successful cardiac arrest resuscitation, which resulted in a walk out of the hospital fully intact save. And this was a 42 year old male father of two, uh, two weeks uh, before Christmas. So that was a remarkable change in, in practice in the area and gained a lot of recognition and it was shortly thereafter that other communities saw that uh, this was a worthwhile program and some expense to it. But some of the other advantages to that was not just the cardiac arrest patient, of course, it was a respiratory patient, a diabetic, the whole whole list of uh, medical and traumatic uh, um, scenarios. But we then um, we were uh, reached out to by uh, other communities, Wilton, Weston, southern part of Georgetown, 
uh, they wanted to do the same thing. And they actually formed a regional consortium because neither of those towns had enough volume nor financial resources to um, make it worthwhile for them or, or feasible for them to cover the cost of that single medic. And this was, a, again, a medic that would be posted in their town. So they, they formed a consortium, Wilton ALS Association, um, and uh, NOAC, uh, uh, we had to compete for the bid on that, and NOAC uh, received that and stationed a, a paramedic up in the uh, town of uh, Wilton. Um, and the resources were shared between Wilton Weston and, and Southern uh, Georgetown. Um, it was interesting uh, scenario in, in that the uh, Georgetown, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Weston um, chief elected official was uh, not a big fan of that the concept and the program initially. Um, didn't really see the value in, in that money, and it's a small community. And um, his community actually uh, gave him the marching orders to uh, proceed and, and implement that. And um, I think it was uh, about a year after the program was uh, up and running in his town that he confessed that it was the best thing that he had uh, done for his, his town. Um, so that was another, another um, advancement for the uh, Fairfield, mid Fairfield County area. And then we also had a similar scenario with New Canaan, New Canaan EMS. So by the time I left New Norwalk Hospital, we were the uh, provider of paramedic uh, services, uh, either with a full ambulance uh, or uh, intercept uh, arrangement through mid Fairfield County. Um, that being said, um, we also were able to be pretty much the innovator and uh, first, uh, first on this, the scene, so to speak, with many treatment modalities. Um, this was many years ago, but NOAA EMS was the first uh, to use uh, external cardiac pacing. Was the first to use. Now these are going to be clinically technical. Uh, the first to use um, uh, be able to access external jugular uh, venous uh, routes for uh, medication. Uh, and fluid replacement. Um, of course, they were always uh, performing endotracheal intubation when other services were not. Um, we um, the, the first to roll out rapid sequence uh, intubation, where in which you paralyze a patient who still has a, a gag reflex, so that you're able to put a tube into the trachea. Um, I, I won't continue to go on and on, but many innovative uh, procedures and interventions. Um, which also allowed NOAA PMS to participate in resuscitation studies, national resuscitation studies. Um, so that's sort of the clinical picture there, but I, I think going back to the financial area, um, again, that was that was that was not easy to accomplish, but by working with the team, um, sharing with my staff the uh, budget reports and letting them take ownership and have uh, a full appreciation of the value of being in um, a lot to do a lot of these things. Um, and so when I started there, the department was well in the red. Um, and when I left, it was well in the black. Um, and again, I'd, I'll repeat that our mutual aid because of practice changes, our mutual aid went from 30%. And those mutual aid calls did not go to a par another paramedic level service. They went to a basic level service on the southern part of town. Um, so we reduced that from, again, that 30% to uh, 0.05%. Um, and that was uh, something that the entire team was proud of. And in fact, the uh, being a hospital based department, uh, many people here may be familiar with the entity called Press Ganey. So Press Ganey is a customer service uh, survey entity that many, many hospitals use across the country. And departments, providers, individuals can be um, judged and assessed and evaluated by their Press Ganey scores. Um, so my department was always ranked uh, number one in the hospital for customer service and high press gainy scores. Um, and that was basically because of the staff. They were good, 
great clinicians and they were just great people um, with wonderful um, patient and customer service skills. And that's in fact why we actually secured all of those paramedic um, satellite contracts, even though we were high bidder in each town. Um, it was the manner in which my paramedics interacted with their EMTs that convinced those service leadership that they wanted to work with the paramedics from uh, Norwalk Hospital. Shall I go on? Um, I'd like you to touch upon um, so that your clinical experience and some of the operational experience at Norwalk, um, according to your biography, you also had various leadership positions and involvement at the state level on the CT EMS advisory board, um, helping to develop the system for EMS. Can you touch upon that as well? What, sure. what activities were you involved in and what roles did you play? Well, while I was at NOAC, I was very involved with the regional committees, um, the regional council, uh, the regional MAC, medical advisory, the regional training and education committee. Actually, I was chair of the uh, need for service committee at the regional level, um, which was an interesting experience. Um, I was very active in that. Um, was active with the uh, stand up of uh, the regional CMED Center. Um, oh, and as well as with um, the uh, NOAA Police Department um, was instrumental in uh, getting them stood up as an EMD PSAP, working together and collaboratively with the police department leadership and the town, with the city rather, to bring in medical priority dispatch uh, consultants and implement the uh, EMD uh, program uh, in, in the city of Norwalk, uh, as well as um, creating a, uh, an official um, first responder. Uh, we had a situation uh, somewhat similar to Weathersfield in which the PD would um, go to calls uh, as uh, first um, due to their proximity, obviously. Um, but there were no real training requirements, no requirements to follow for education or equipment or supplies. So it was sort of a good faith effort but they were outside of the realm of any regulatory um, requirements. Um, so we worked with the police department and the fire department and together um, there was, the outcome was to have a designated first responder in the community. That was in Norwalk? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and as far as you know right now, there is not a designated first responder in Weathersfield other than WEMSA, is that right? Uh, that's my understanding that, uh, again, the police will go, um, but, you know, it, it's up to them as to what education and training standards they want to impose upon their officers, uh, what equipment they'll carry, um, what supplies they'll carry, um, or if they'll go, you know, there, there's no obligation for them to, to really respond. So, in other words, um, no regulatory uh, established criteria that they're bound to comply with in that regard is in in terms of what's expected of a designated first responder. Right, because then you're regulated by the Department of Health. Okay. Uh, with regard to the um, St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center experience as the EMS manager in, in the emergency department, can you elaborate on what your role and responsibilities were there? Well, sure. And, and then um, uh, I apologize, but um, perhaps I'll circle back to my sure my role with the EMS Advisory Board. Oh, yes. Thank um, you. Yeah, no, my fault. Uh, so as the uh, EMS manager uh, at St. Francis, I was brought on board to um, enhance the program that they had in place to work with the EMS services and the providers. And we did so by increasing the education offerings, training, uh, working uh, more closely with the services under the sponsor hospital umbrella of St. Francis, and to actually work on the customer care aspect so that the EMTs and paramedics 
when they would arrive at St. Francis ER, they would be um, treated with uh, respect as fellow healthcare providers. Um, they would be trusted in their assessments and, and uh, information they had to share, and that it would become more of a, a family and team. We also made some changes in their facility um, to give them an area in which they could chart with some, some comfort and privacy, um, a few beverage options. Um, we worked hard to create an environment in which the EMS folks would feel like they were really a professional and regarded as such, um, and not relegated to a back hallway trying to find a, a counter space to write their chart. Um, so that that actually was very successful. Um, St. Francis, I believe, went from the uh, realms of perhaps not being uh, considered EMS friendly to incredibly EMS friendly. Um, and it, you know, it just took some working with the staff, having it, people understand the dynamics, the value and importance. Um, we also had nurses go out and ride with EMS. Um, we, we really did a lot with EMS uh, because we recognize that um, they are the first persons to see the patients that would be seen in the ED. So it was important to the ED and to the hospital to uh, make sure that that care was, was stellar. And in fact, um, there was some work that we did with the, with the dispatch systems in that area as well, because um, myself and the uh, EMS doc, uh, we worked with several communities for their EMD, uh, the response to assignments, so we were very familiar with that. In fact, um, I uh, participated with the creation of the response assignments uh, along with Dr. Wolf um, for Weathersfield some eight, eight or so years ago. Um, and other communities as well, East Hartford, Simsbury. Um, so we, we were engaged with that, um, that component of the EMS system. Okay, before you go on, can you elaborate a little more with regard to exactly who Dr. Wolf was, what his role was at St. Francis when he worked on the dispatch or EMD responses for the town of Wethersfield, I believe you said. Right, right. right. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. So um, each sponsor hospital has a physician who's been designated as the EMS medical control physician. It may be the chairperson, it may be an attending. But in any case, uh, Dr. Wolf was um, the EMS medical director, um, who then became the chair of the department. And I don't recall at the time of our review of the Weathersfield um, EMD response assignments if he was the chair at that point or not. But he, um, very well known and respected physician in the EMS community, a uh, strong champion served as the chair of the state's medical advisory committee. I'm sorry, the regional medical advisory committee for many, many years and uh, served also on the state medical advisory committee. And what specifically did we work on regarding the EMD responses in the town of Wethersfield with Dr. Wolf? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it's, it's a laborious process. So within the EMD program, um, I don't know how much detail you want me to get into on this right now, um, but the EMD process uh, basically involves the PSAP call taker gathering information from the caller and it, um, answering questions that are scripted, uh, in most cases scripted, entering those answers into uh, either a, a computer program or in some cases where individuals may be still using sort of um, flip cards, like, uh, you know, flip cards. Uh, anyway, they get the answers to the questions. It's all algorithm driven. Uh, and at, at various points, the uh, call taker is given the answer to the question of who do I send and how do I send them? So when you look at the different types of calls or cases, it could be chest pain, shortness of breath, a fall, unknown, allergic reaction, whatever. 
When those questions are all asked and answered, you then are confronted with, like I said, what do we do with that? So that's really one of the key portions in which the medical director becomes involved with the EMS provider. I mean, it's really a system to help the EMS provider create the appropriate responses to the call, the medical and trauma calls within their community. So this basically usually typically involves the EMS um, service leadership. I mean, it always involves the EMS service leadership, okay? The medical director to provide his clinical and medical oversight. Um, typically the, official, the leadership of the designated first responder. And uh, in some cases, if there's sort of a uh, de facto first responder, then that leadership. Um, oftentimes a, uh, well, on occasion, a town representative will, um, and the uh, PSAC. So those parties will come together and start working through all the various different response assignments. So the calls get coded um, through a, 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 a tiered system, uh, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Deco, Elta. And then for each of those categories, you have a general sense of what you'd like to send and how. And, and what I mean by that is, do we send an ambulance? Do we send a first responder? Do we send rescue? Do we send police? Um, so that's sort of one grouping of, of uh, entities that you need to address if you're going to send them. And then the second part of that is how. So do we send them lights and siren, which is oftentimes referred to as hot, or cold, no lights and sirens? And the, the goal is to reduce unnecessary light and siren response within the community because it's a dangerous mode of response. The goal is also to reduce unnecessary use of resources, scarcer resources. So if you can code a, a, a call at the BLS level and not send, not have to send a paramedic on it, and if you can further code it as, as cold, you know, the ambulance goes, no lights and sirens with traffic, and uh, it's two EMTs or an EMT and an ER. Um, likewise, if it's a, a critical call determined to be life-threatening, then you know to send the ambulance hot and the paramedic hot and, and, and whoever else might be needed. And sometimes it's a combination of the two where you might send the ambulance hot and the paramedic cold. So there's lots of different um, permutations of that. So when you worked on the, um, the system with Dr. Wolf for Weathersfield, um, at what juncture was the decision put back into the um, responsibility of the dispatcher to decide how and what? So the dispatcher would typically be given this menu to follow. So it would be the first responder entity and the EMS provider, along with medical direction, um, looking at each case and deciding whether or not it made sense to send the ambulance and the first responder and the paramedic or just the ambulance or get everybody going and then cancel. So these were all predetermined response assignments that would be plugged into the ESAP system, if you will, or the CAD system. And the dispatcher's role would be to essentially follow those directives. So um, the opportunity for the PSAP to really have um, input into those assignments was during the, the planning session where everybody was at the table. And I would see that, that most of the weight for the decision-making came between the EMS provider and first responder as part of the EMS system. Um, those were the key pillars under medical direction, medical control. So in the town of Weathersfield, I think you testified that there was not a, a uh, designated first responder. So when you were working on this 
development of this system with Dr. Wolf for the town of Wethersfield, was there a um, an entity that stood in the shoes of a first responder that you worked with, or was that role just not present in the development of this system? So I can't be 100%. But hold on, I, I, hold on, hold on. Attorney Reinhardt. You know, obviously, to the extent she was just laying background foundation about his qualifications and whatnot, I'm kind of fine, let this go on. But it's now on a topic that is not relevant. This is not a proceeding about changing the PSAP. It is not a proceeding about changing the EMT protocols. The hearing officer doesn't have authority to do either things. You've already ruled that the EMT protocols are irrelevant uh, because they're not going to change based on who is who is the outcome of this proceeding. Um, so I think this is not relevant to the scope of what is being decided. Yeah, I'm going to sustain the objection, Council. Well, why don't you move on to sure, I, I think the background. And I and I have a a, a good understanding yeah. of the qualifications Mr. Quinlaven right. has. So why don't you move on to the um, actual questioning pertaining to the application before me today? Sure. I I just want to say that um, with regard to that line of questioning, the WEMSA Exhibit GG, which was prepared by Mr. Quinlaven, and you'll hear from him on, uh, does address dispatch and improvements in the dispatch and, and uh, communication system for the town of Wethersfield. And that's why I was delving into that on a superficial level with them at this point in time. So I do, I, I do think it's relevant, but perhaps its relevance will become more glaring as we proceed into this hearing. Um, Mr. Quinlaven, you are the president of Emergency Medical Solutions LLC, correct? That's correct. Now, um, before I go, I go in, and, and that's a current entity that you use as a consulting group? Yes. All right. Um, before I get into your association with WEMSA, I just want to come back because you mentioned it and brought it to my attention. You served on the, as the chairman of the CTEMS advisory board, and I neglected to follow up with you on that. Could you please briefly talk about when and what you did when you were in that role? Sure. Well, when the legislature first created the EMS Advisory Board um, quite a few years ago, many, um, I was a, one of the original members. Um, I served as an uh, active member on various committees, um, became the uh, vice chair, and then um, became the chair of that uh, advisory committee, served as a chair for over a decade. And um, I'm, I'm really quite proud of what the board was able to accomplish. Um, uh, we had a, a board that um, became more cohesive, uh, more uh, task oriented. Um, we created, um, we empowered chairs of the various subcommittees to, to work um, with their groups to actually um, have a productive uh, output for um, products uh, to improve the EMS in the state of Connecticut. Uh, gosh, there's just so many things that we were able to do. Of reciprocity with neighboring states is, is one thing. Um, the board can, you know, just the uh, conference, just uh, very involved every year with the legislative process and working with legislators to um, uh, and, enact laws that would strengthen the EMS system, uh, correct efficiencies. Just about everything you see, um, the regulations, uh, any any statute changes over the last few years were the result of the of the advisory board, and there were about a dozen different committees on that board. In fact, one of those one of those committees is the Mobile Integrated Health Committee, which I had stood up while I was chair, and it's a few years back. So that that was a project uh, that's still ongoing. Um, but uh, that is the committee. It is the advisory board in which the state EMS Medical Advisory Committee is a is a component. So. The uh, phys EMS physician community actually um, works um, through the advisory board for its recommendations for clinical care and um, uh, skill skill requirements and so forth. Um, well, many different committees on their public information, education, education training, uh, legislative uh, data. Uh, it's a it's a very important committee. In fact, you'll notice in um, and bills introduced and existing statute that there's reference to the uh, Department of Health 
working in conjunction or, in cons or consulting with this advisory board. So it's a very important group within the, in the state uh, EMS. Um, and I'm very happy that I was able to turn it over to um, the several uh, individuals who have taken it and uh, continued the great work and have done their own great work uh, uh, since uh, my departure. I'm still on the board. I'm still a, a legislative uh, appointee to the board. Um, and um, during that time, I also served as the chief of medical services for the uh, Travelers uh, Championship PGA tournament in Cromwell, which is New England's largest sporting event taking place over a week in Cromwell, Connecticut, not too far from here. And uh, so, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, by the way, when you served on the EMS Advisory Committee, um, did you have an opportunity to meet representatives from Hart Hartford Healthcare? Oh, yes. Um, that was rather easy to do because there were many of them. Um, um, good people. Um, in fact, the uh, the existing chair is uh, in the Hartford Healthcare um, Corporation. As is Who is the, that? Uh, Greg Allard. Mm -hmm. Um, as is the uh, chair of the uh, MIH subcommittee. MIH meaning Mobile Integrated Healthcare? Healthcare yes, sorry. And who is that? That's Josh uh, Bollier. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a lot of folks uh, on the advisory board and its committees that are affiliated with Hartford Healthcare. Thank you. Now, with regard to uh, your uh, presence here today. What is your association or relationship with WEMSA, as we'll call them, Weathersfield EMS Association? Uh, well, I am a uh, consultant. And how long have you been in that role? Um, 14 months, 17 days, and three hours. <laughs> 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 You're counting the hours. <laughs> right. No, I actually, to, to honest, uh, uh, more honestly answer, I was re contacted by the chief. Um, um, I've had uh, probably about four to six weeks after my official retirement from St. Fran, uh, July 1 of uh, 23. Um, and he reached out to me and asked if I would be uh, available and interested in helping them with their, their plan to uh, uh, upgrade their delivery model. Okay, that was in 2023? Yes. Chief McMahon, had you known him before that? Oh, yes, absolutely. How did you know him? Well, I knew him as the chief of Weathersfield EMS. I knew him as a, a leader who was able to um, correct a number of deficiencies um, in the service. Um, um, he, he stepped in during a, uh, a difficult period in that service's history and was able to uh, right the ship, so to speak. And we worked very well together. I helped him out. He helped me out. Um, we developed a, a, a good relationship. In fact, um, I think it was his predecessor, but Weathersfield uh, became a sponsor, uh, a service sponsored by St. Francis um, uh, due to the, the great working relationship um, that I had with the chief. I had a good relationship with the former chief as well. Um, well, we've always said, now I say we because I'm. I, sometimes I speak as if I'm still at St. Francis and it's over a year that I'm not. But um, there was a great relationship established, um, you know, great people, good EMTs, um, really dedicated folks, uh, always interested in, in, in really doing the right thing. And it was a good service to work with. So um, I think that's probably how I became uh, um, acquainted with the chief, um, which I'm grateful for every day. Thank you. Um, so before I go further, with regard to your um, experience in EMS, are you still an EMT? No, I haven't been an EMT for many, many years. Okay, so I am a paramedic, however. You're a paramedic. How long have you been a paramedic? I don't have enough fingers. Um, That's okay. A few decades. <laughs> yes. Without giving away your youth, your youth. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, uh, since 1975. And do you still provide services as a paramedic? I do not. I am not clinically active at this time. When was the last time you were clinically active? Well, I would provide some um, some 
minimal patient care, if you will, in the emergency department on occasion. Um, At San Francis Hospital? Yeah. Okay. But it was more of assisting patients than actually interventions, uh, clinical interventions. So I've not, oh, it was that long, probably a few years. All right. Uh, with regard to the EMT training programs, do you are you aware of where the um, programs, for the most part, are in the state of Connecticut? Well, um, I'm aware of of many. Um, I've taught uh, for some of them. Uh, one up in Windsor, joint course between Windsor and, and Bloomfield. Uh, I've taught for them. Um, I did a lot of teaching while I was uh, the EMS manager. We did what was called continuing education programs. Um, so we would be out uh, about once a month, sometimes more, speaking to the EMS uh, providers in that area, about various entities, STEMI, you know, heart attacks, uh, strokes, uh, trauma, crushing injuries, just a lot of different topics, uh, um, poisoning, uh, drowning, everything. But, and my, my approach on those continuing education programs was to always provide um, high level um, clinicians. So our series of presentations uh, almost always were focused around a physician, an expert in his his or her field, providing the lecture and discussion uh, with the EMT and paramedic audience. We actually did a, a what we call a dinner series in which um, I, I really enjoyed this because so often EMS ongoing education is you know, a, a provider um, giving great talk and education in the training room or sometimes in the bay of a fire station with a bunch of uh, lukewarm pizza. And we kicked it up a notch and, and did these dinner CMEs where we brought people in. It was sort of like what the physician community and the nurse practice community and the PA are used to with the, with the dinners. Uh, um, that are provided the educational dinners that are provided for those folks based you know from various entities in, in the in the in the in the trade so we provided um, this type of an environment a uh, high level very professional environment which was very conducive to conversation and uh, allowed everybody to get to know each other so, so those were the programs that we we tried to do uh, along with skills and I've been down the weather field any number of times to provide um, sort of uh, low, lower um, intensity talks. We didn't necessarily always do the dinner, but I do recall that we had uh, an entity come in. We had some some uh, we had some cater cater the meal down there for them. But um, yeah, so in my own hometown, um, you know, they run an EMT class every year, just about every year. So, and, and running EMT courses is, is a, a technique that a lot of uh, services will utilize for recruitment. Okay, and, and so uh, in your experience, has the EMT training pathway been an important component for developing EMTs in the communities that they serve? Oh, absolutely. I just want to register an, an objection. At, at this point, we're just really going far afield of relevant topics, talking about enhancing EMT training in the field, but I don't know again, where I'm, again, again, it goes I'll, to our plan. Yeah, I, but but counselor, I, I, I'm going to sustain the objection again. We just let's it, it goes to the plan, but let's get to the plan. Let's talk about the plan. Um, I'm at this sure, point. I'll, I'm, head, I'm well I'll, aware. I'll head in is, that direction. Excuse me. Don't interrupt me. Um, I'm well aware of his background and 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 what he's done i want to know about his consulting for wemsa so let's get to the direct questioning please uh, mr quinn laban you were brought in by chief mcmahon um in 2023 to assist with the development of the expansion plan for wemsa I believe that was what you testified to. Is that right? That's right. All right. Can you be more specific as to what your initial activities were with regard to um, beginning the project that you were assigned by Mr. by Chief McMahon? Sure. So the initial conversations, I would say, focused primarily on the 
desire to their desire to be a full service provider to their community. They had the BLS and ALS PSAs, and a couple of things were going on, as I understood it. They had transitioned from a volunteer model in which they were covering nights and weekends and some holidays. They were having difficulty even doing that with the volunteer model. And so they, like many other volunteer services, were experiencing the challenge of getting volunteer EMT staff. We're transitioning to a paid or career staff. During that process, um, they were beginning to cover more calls. And I guess one thing led to another, and, and their intent then became more clear that if they were now going to be providing more of the service to the community that they were obligated to provide and not rely on an external service, that they also wanted to provide paramedic level of care to which they held the PSA. So that was the initial assignment was, John, can you help us come up with a, uh, an approach to get us up to speed with paramedics? We want to bring paramedics in-house. And so we, I put together a couple different um, thoughts on, on how to do that. One was to hire their own paramedics in-house and have them become employees. And the other thought which prevailed was to outsource the uh, hiring of uh, paramedics from um, established staffing entities, um, which didn't limit, by the way, um, contracting with just staffing entities. It also allowed for them to contract with existing paramedic level EMS services, such as uh, what I was familiar with in Norwalk. So Norwalk was a paramedic level service and was contracted for by these towns to provide paramedic staff. So there was initial outreach to staffing agencies and some of the EMS providers. It kind of their temperature on the interest that they may or may not have in in stepping into the Wethersfield area to provide this paramedic staffing. With regard to your outreach uh, to the paramedic providers, do you recall what organizations you reached out to? Well, let's see. Um, there was obviously NEFERS, um, ERM, uh, Vintech, <coughs> AMR. I didn't reach out to Aetna. I understood the chief was uh, having ongoing discussions with Aetna. And I reached out to Trinity as well. Did you um, during that period? Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. There was another entity. Oh, what was their name? Echo, Shelton. I'm sorry. Their actual name is escapes me now. But um, Echo Hose. Echo Hose, Shelton, something like that in Shelton, Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. Now, did you also reach out to the paramedic training programs to uh, uh, understand that as a potential source for paramedics as well? No, I don't believe I did. Okay. Are you aware of the paramedic training programs in the state? Yes, a good many of them. Okay. And um, essentially, are they a, a source that you contemplate utilizing as part of the plan goes forward for Sourcing paramedics? Well, um, yes, either directly or indirectly. You know, there are um, paramedic programs that are affiliation with services during the ride time and all can can provide a source of, of new um, paramedics. In the Weathersfield area, do you know uh, who sponsors the paramedic training programs? I might object. He testified that that wasn't a source he considered to staff with initially. 
And so I'm not sure where this is going. Well, initially, but uh, as the plan evolved, the question was whether he intended to consider using that as a source for paramedics to staff the organization. I'll allow the question. I, thank you. <clears throat> Would you mind repeating that question? Yes. Have you, cons as a resource for paramedics going forward as the uh, plan that you developed is implemented, were you considering using the paramedic training schools as a source for paramedic staff? Well, yes. Okay, so there's two ways to do that. Um, either through the agency in which the paramedics are contracted, okay, or paramedics, when they're in their training and education program, they have to pr they have what's called a, a field clinical ship or internship, all right? So they need to actually um, be in a clinical environment in the hospital and then on an ambulance to uh, learn the, the skill set that they need to take care of patients once they're on their own. So that field internship takes place at any number of different ambulance services across the state. Weathersfield EMS becoming then a an actual provider of paramedic services would be in a good position then to uh, encourage students from these programs. And these programs are typically always looking for additional field internship sites to bring these students on board, work with the uh, experienced medics now with Weathersfield EMS, establish that relationship and um, provide that, that opportunity to those paramedic students. And you know, once you build that relationship, People become familiar, and there's a, a, a greater chance that perhaps one of these uh, graduates would be interested in going to work for the Weathersfield EMS. Uh, EMS. So, so that was um, a component of the plan that's been presented as um, WEMS's plan for the hearing officer's consideration. Is that right? I don't know that it's spelled out uh, that clearly within the plan. <clears throat> But was it part of what your overall concept was for developing the paramedics that WEMSA would be utilizing at its on-site facilities in Weathersfield? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so you began to work with the organization to implement a plan for expansion. And can you describe what your um, initial research and uh, investigation entailed in order to come up with a proposal for Chief McMahon. Excuse me, before I, this is not an objection, but it would it be possible to remove the document so that we could see uh, the witness a little bit better? Oh, we thought you could see him. I'm sorry. So it's it's everything is very, very square. small because yeah. of the document. How's that? If you stop sharing your screen, that would. There we go. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I apologize. I thought that while I was sharing that document, you could see the witness. It it just creates everyone into very tiny boxes. Okay. So if you were not talking about the document anymore, it, it made sense to try to remove it so we could have better vision. Well, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, where were we? Mr. Quinlaben, um, did you familiarize yourself with any particular laws? declaratory rulings, statutes, regulations, or other um, advisements with regard to <clears throat> how to go forward to come up with a proposal for Chief McMahon. I'm not sure that I needed to. I was quite familiar with all those laws and regulations related to EMS through my um, work you know, with 40 years in the system. Okay. Were you familiar with the um, prevailing statutes that related to local EMS plans? Oh, yes. All right. And and had you been involved in developing a local EMS plan before for a community? We bits and pieces. Um, nothing to the degree that I became involved with uh, WAMSA. Okay. But, you know, working as the EMS manager and being the uh, contact for several services uh, under the sponsor hospital umbrella. Yeah, I would 
be a, a kind of a pro bono um, consultant, if you will, for various services working on their plans. All right. Um, I guess what I'm getting to is when you you began your um, to perform the services that Chief McMahon asked you to provide to come up with a proposal. Were, was there particular information that you looked to to verify with regard to WEMSA as a licensed entity by the department, or any other information that comes to mind that you considered? in developing that proposal? Well, uh, you know, absolutely. I think one of the first things I, I did was to uh, reach out to the DPH uh, website and uh, confirm that they were, in fact, uh, the PSA holder at the basic level and the paramedic level. If they were not the PSA holder at the paramedic level, then uh, I don't know that we would have had much room to really progress <laughs> with any any of, the, of those plans. And what else did you do? Regarding After you verified their licensure and uh, capacity, did you get involved with any particular individuals at WEMSA's organization? Well, um, there were some introductory conversations with his leadership team. And who were they? Uh, Kevin Clark, who I'd worked with previously, um, Rob Pelletier, um, uh, uh, DCO. Um, Vieira, who's uh, the treasurer, who I worked with um, during my uh, activities with the Travelers Championship, because uh, he's a biomedical engineer at St. Fran, so we needed his help with equipment for the Travelers Championship. So, yeah, we, we had conversations. I, I asked questions, got a, a feel for, a better feel for where they wanted to go. I think I gained a better appreciation for where they were with providing BLS services and the depth of their leadership team, um, their their desires and interests versus what they um, had ready to go with, and weighed those factors with um, my decision making, uh, whether they go down path A or path B. You know, A being hire your own paramedics and become employees in house, uh, or path B, um, uh, a contract for that service. So as you proceeded, um, did you also work with any of the um, outside agents that serve at, I'm sorry, WEMSA as um, uh, vendors such as the Kara Shields who works with the billing and um, collections for the organization or their quality assurance people? You know, can you, can you talk about whether you interacted with any of those people as part of your planning process. Sure. Um, Tara and I are now on a first name basis <laughs> uh, with uh, accurate billing. Uh, she, she's uh, really knowledgeable. She's actually used by a number of uh, very reputable EMS providers in the state, um, which was ha I was happy to learn. Um, high performance systems. So she takes care of the billing for those. And they're not just small companies. They're, they're really large companies, um, some of them. Um, so, yes, uh, frequent interaction with her, um, was able to gather some information about the billings, the revenue, um, the payer mix, which is a sweet payer mix. Um, and then I worked also with uh, some vendors um, in putting together the uh, proposal to obtain the paramedic level equipment that would be necessary, such as cardiac monitors, defibrillators, um, uh, airway equipment, um, you know, air, everything that a paramedic needs with their uh, equipment and supplies. So I worked with um, Stryker Medical, um, worked with um, Common Sense, you know, various uh, different vendors of, of all walks. And, and that was for purposes of costing out the equipment that would be needed and, and um, timing? logistics for acquiring that equipment. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, the capital equipment purchases, um, leases, um, payment schedule, um, payment terms uh, in the case of the suppliers. Um, also worked um, with a, a gentleman I had previous experience with who um, provides uh, EMS quality uh, assurance services. And who was that? Uh, Gerard, Paul Gerard. 
Um, his firm is Gerard and Associates. Um, I had great experience with with him and his team while up at St. Fran. Um, it's an independent external source of quality review. They pull charts. They're given access to the EMS, uh, the EMT and paramedic charts. They review the charts uh, against uh, protocol compliance, uh, good clinical judgment, um, documentation, and um, they score the charts based upon any of their findings um, and report back to the, the service and share that with the sponsor hospital. And uh, they come in and do remediation or they'll meet with the individual uh, providers. And it's a really top notch service. So I, I set uh, WEMSA up with, with uh, Paul to provide that service. So. Thank you, that was my next question. I just want to go back to something you said. You looked at the payer mix in your discussions with Care Shields, and you referred to a sweet payer mix. What do you mean by that? Well, the self pay is only about 5%. And how does the rest of it break down? Oh, you know, without referring to my notes, I think it was. Medicare, Medicaid. Well, yeah, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial, and then self pay. And then self pay in the EMS world is often referred to as no pay. Um, but in Webster's case, um, a self pay doesn't automatically equal zero. Um, they they do fairly well with the self pays. I mean, I think the the, the bad debt um, from uh, for Wemsit, from what I saw, um, was about three point seven percent on one report. And how recent was that report that you're referring to? Within the last few months. Okay. Um, earlier, you were here when the chief testified that the bad debt was somewhere around five percent. Was that also consistent with some of the reports that you reviewed over time? Yeah, I would say so. Okay, and it varies from time to it time. Does. Okay, um, do you know what the percentage of payer mix is for the Medicare versus the commercial payer side? I On have it available to me, but I don't have it off the top. All right, of just didn't know if you knew on the, off the top of your head. Um, with regard to the ALS portion, do you have any recollection as to the what that figure is? Yes. Sorry, can I, you just clarify, did you say the ALS portion? Paramedic. Okay. Again, I'd have to, I, I just like, um, I like to refer to documentation, okay, um, and not rely upon my memory. That's right. We can we'll we'll get to that because I believe that you may have included some of those statistics in the EMS plan that you prepared. <clears throat> I'd like to ask if you could please pull up um, exhibit town exhibit sixteen, council. Um, and again, my exhibit, my exhibit is a uh, compendium oh, of over five hundred pages. Time. You'll have to do your own exhibits for the moment. Yeah. That person. Yeah. Can, who yeah the person who was to, doing that is no longer in the room at the moment. Had to step out. All right. Well, then may we take a five minute break because my exhibit 16 is not separate from a, an exhibit that's about 500 pages. And so I need to um, find that within the document so that I can pull it up. Yeah, that's fine. Let's take a five minute Thank break. Thank you. We are uh, I am able to answer that question now. Oh, so I... Before we go, oh, I'm okay, sorry, we're Mr. back Clinton. on the record. Yes. What is the question you were able to answer? You were you were asking, I believe, about the payer mix. Yes. So the uh, payer mix is uh, Medicare is sixty two percent, Medicaid is eighteen percent, commercial is eighteen, and self pay is three. Can I, I'm just sorry. repeat that? And could you also say, if you, it looks like you're looking at that documentation, could you tell us what documentation you're looking at? Yes, I'm looking at my worksheet, my notes. Is that something that's been produced? I, I wasn't aware that he was planning to do that. So do you have a worksheet that's been submitted into 
the EMS plan? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Well, um, why don't I take a look at what he's looking at and understanding that council might want a copy of that worksheet um, because you're testifying from it. Could we take a 10 minute break and I'll sort through yeah, this? Yeah, let's please. Yeah, we'll take a 10 minute break. We are off the record. Thank you. I definitely like a copy of it.
All right. I have exhibit J, which is actually the same. We'll wait for council, but it's the same yeah. exhibit as 16. Okay, it looks like everybody's back. So let's go back on the record, please. Okay, council, you may proceed. All right. Um, first of all, I did ask Mr. Quinn Laban to send me the worksheet that he was looking at, and he's emailing it to me, and I can provide it to council. It's uh, Mr. Quinn Laban. Um, we're back on the record here. Yes. Would you please describe what's on that worksheet? And I, I'm happy to circulate it. Sure. I mean, it makes sense to circulate it and then you could question him on that the next hearing. Sure, we can do that. And yeah. it's yeah, it's it, a breakdown of payer mix. Okay, so why don't we do that? Um I was going to before go ahead, we move on, uh it appears that, that Mr. Quinn Laven is uh using a computer. Is he viewing his computer while he's testifying? I don't believe he has been. I think he's been looking at the screen. I asked him to, when he pulled up that worksheet, which I wasn't anticipating, I asked him to send it to me. That's why his computer's up. But he also has some hearing impairment and is using an earpiece to hear. I don't know how that interplays with the devices we're using, but he's got it plugged into his computer. So does he need the computer open while he's being questioned? Can you answer that question? We can close it. He can close his computer. Okay, yeah. And, um, you know, as long as we're not in a questioning phase at this point. Uh, oh, it's I now lost the sound now. Oh, see. Okay. Mr. Quinlavin loses the sound. He's getting better hearing capability when the computer's open, but can you have it marginally open or turned away yeah, from you? Yeah. Okay. I, sorry. I I'm sorry. I actually, yeah. Uh, okay. I, it's so I just, wanted, device. I just wanted to leave some time to discuss scheduling. Um, so now might be a good time to break with the questioning and let's turn to scheduling because I only have until 4 p.m. Yes. Um, we did swap scheduling uh, dates, okay. Your Honor, okay. and uh, I'm just getting to, I, I think council received my reply to them with regard to dates of availability. I, and, it, we combined them and I could read what is available, um, if that helps. I mean, that's great. Um, and hearing officer, I apologize. There are a number of dates where there are minor um, time limitations. So uh, November 12th, everyone is available all day. November okay. 19th, available until 2 o'clock. 20th, also available until 2 o'clock. 25th, available until 3 o'clock. 26th, available until 3 o'clock. And 27th, available until 1 o'clock. All right, let me just check. My schedule. So the 12th works for me. The 19th works for me. The 20th, um, I'm going to reserve that for now because I do have another hearing scheduled, but there's potential that that might be settled. So if we could schedule it for the 20th, I'll do so, but I won't commit to that today. Um, let's see the the 25th I can do the 26th I can do and the 27th I can do so would you like me to send in writing the time issues no and because here's what we'll do um, okay. I'll schedule them all for 9 a.m. Okay. and then the day of the hearing someone just remind us of when we need to end that day Okay, absolutely. I just wanted okay. to make sure, you know, it wasn't an inconvenience to anyone. No, it, that's that's fine with me. So, um, so I will have notices sent out for the 12th, the 19th, the 25th, the 26th, and 27th, all beginning at 9 a.m. Right. <clears throat> yes, and then 
Our next hearing date, just to confirm, is the 21st at 9 a.m. The 22nd. The 22nd. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, okay. the 22nd at the 9 The 21st is a holiday, some people tell me, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's good. Um, okay, so if everybody's okay, we can go back to, to questioning, or did you want to just end it for the day? I, I'll leave it up to you. Um, I think it would be a good point to end it because I'm going to embark upon the proposals in the plan, and that is a protracted line of questioning. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, with that, we are adjourned for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank right. you very much. You're welcome.